really speaks to um, some um, sort of universal themes on on the sort of tenderness and, and passions um, that we all experience in life and um, through our um, sort of dynamics with others and in relationships. Um, Tani Lonsdale is originally from London and uh, is now based in LA. Um, and this is really the newest series of, of her work, um, exploring sort of relational complexity and, um, and semi-abstract painting. Um, Tani, can you tell us a little bit more about the show? Yeah. And also, don't love public speaking. <laughs> but, um, so, Tenderloin, I normally come up with the titles to the show after I've made the paintings. So, on reflection and looking at my paintings and this body of work, um, the idea of Tenderloin came up because I mean, it's twofold. I, I like the, the meat reference, the carnalness and the flesh of being human and the emotions and the passions we have. Um, my paintings reference sort of sex and coupling, but not in, not in a too sexual way. It's more of a, um, I don't know, an emotional way. Um, and I liked the, the tender aspect because there's a lot of tenderness to the paintings and to being human as well. Um, there's a lot of embracing and love and support, and just on a personal level, um, you Excuse know. Excuse me, could you speak up a little bit? <laughs> I can <Please>. try. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just talking about tender part of the title um, and how it's important because uh, in the paintings I'm referencing sort of connectivity, um, connections, and intimacy and vulnerability and. As humans, as, as a mother, as a woman, but um, just a personal experience of, of what I need and what maybe I was lacking and what I was searching for. Um, so the paintings in the show are, yeah, they're, they're about being human, about being a mother, about sex, about gender narratives, um, and they're very autobiographical as well. Tani, can you tell us a little bit about how your process has evolved over the years. This is a new exhibition and the work is very much, um, more than ever we're seeing a sort of figure you know, foregrounded in the work. Um, can you talk about um, some of your previous work and how you got to it? So a strong theme in my work is domesticity. Um, and I would say that this started around the time when I started having kids, which seems very natural. Um, and actually it's when my work, that was when my work really had some meaning and felt like I was connecting with it. So previous to that, it was it was kind of abstract, automatic painting, and I was kind of just seeing what I was making as I went along. Um, but then I started referencing domestic scenes. I was painting, I had my kids, I was painting what was around me, I was painting my living room, I was painting the furniture, but it was there was always a narrative, there was always a story, and there was always uh, characters. And it was autobiographical looking back on it, although at the time it, it kind of felt very, random. Um, but when I moved to LA four years ago, I started really um, using the figure in my work a lot more. I became really prominent and central. Um, and I think that is just because moving to LA um, really highlighted what it was to be a woman now. Because I got there, I didn't have a visa, I was, my husband was working, I had the kids, I didn't have a studio, I didn't have any money, so I, it felt very... Um, you know, it, I, how it was to be a woman felt really strong. I felt really isolated and really like I'd gone back 50 years. So the paintings became really personal. They became about me and how I, you know, as a woman, how I felt in the world. And, and I was kind of angry and resentful about having been put in this position. So, you know, and then I, I was using furniture still, but the furniture was kind of morphing into figures. So it was kind of a very emotional response to my situation. I think a lot of a, a lot of this response is also something that a lot of people can relate to, that there, there is this element of biography, but also it's quite universal, that you know, this is um, very current within our culture today, uh, talking about the Time's Up movement, and with other movements with the fourth wave feminism, and readdressing these sorts of um, imbalances, and you know, still how relevant it is um, to discuss women's case in the world today. Um, Bianca, can you talk a little bit about your your understanding of the expression. Yeah, I mean, I think what Tani mentioned about having universal qualities that are not just necessarily female, even though it relates to your personal experience as being a woman, I think most people can 
respond to an art that affects us in, with the ability to speak to several kinds of conditions. Um, I think in these paintings you feel a sense of attention or an uncomfortableness or a claustrophobia which is very present and even though there's this layer of humor and, and a beautiful color to it, there's still this kind of feeling of struggle between almost like two worlds and you know I think when we look at it from a sort of interpersonal perspective, we think about it in terms of what's unconscious and conscious for us as human beings. What is voluntary memory and what is involuntary? So things that are automatic that we can respond to with raw emotion and things that are conditioned to, you know, to us as being you know, people in society. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, to me, I, I think uh, one of the things that drew my attention about the exhibition is like how I think in certain works uh, you could see a kind of relationship to other female artists, both um, um, historical and contemporary. So I think that there's a kind of a similar sensibility, for instance, um, something that I know is completely unrelated to, to Tani's uh, experience, but um, there's a picture, uh, a painting on the back room, uh, Love and Support. It's the figure that's kind of weighed down by this stick, and it's almost like a figure is a uh, kind of furniture, is like a table or something, you know, like. But to me, this reminded me very much of this very iconic painting by a modernist painter from Brazil called Tarsila do Aral, a painting called Abaporu, which is also uh, has this um, big distorted figure on the, you know, like in the, in the center of the composition. And Abaporu uh, is a painting that deals with uh, completely something completely different, which is. Um, national identity, so at the time the modernists in Brazil were trying to find uh, what uh, uh, modern art in Brazil could be, and they were drawing on this kind of indigenous uh, references, and Abaporu literally uh, means in the indigenous language a man eating man or a cannibal, which is a practice that was very common uh, amongst the Tupi Indians <coughs> in Brazil. So, so there's this, but then when I look at that at the front, it reminds me of um, Sarah Lucas somehow, you know, with the, you know, like this uh, female body and the furniture. And downstairs, the yoga painting to me has a very Gastonian feeling. Uh, now, you know, like not female, but uh, other types of art historical references. So I think I could recognize quite a lot. And it was quite funny, because when Bianca arrived here, she, she mentioned Maria last name. And when I returned today, I also mentioned to, to Jessica, I said, oh, you know what? I, you know, I think that there's a connection to Maria last name as well. And it's interesting that you did up on Sarah Lucas as well, because there is um, really a, one of the starting points of, of your, your latest body of work, Tani, is looking at, at furniture and sort of um, the establishes of furniture that you'd often find discarded on the side of the road. Yeah, um, so I recently, I would say in the last three years, I started um, to make sculptures before I made my paintings. It's, I kind of like maquette said I would make the paintings from. Um, I started experimenting with uh, doll's house furniture because it was, I thought in my head, it needs to be furniture, it's really important, it's very symbolic, but I, you know, it, it needs, I can't handle full size furniture, so I, I ordered all these bits of doll's house furniture, created these sculptures, photographed them, and with the photographs I then made drawings, and from the drawings I made these abstract paintings which then turned into a figure that at some point, either on the canvas or in the preliminary drawings, it became vaguely figurative, but very much more abstract than these. And then from there I started to make sculptures out of small bits of furniture, like chairs in my studio and bed sheets and anything I could find, and again these these became figurative paintings and then it's only within the last year that I started noticing these pre-made sculptures on the sidewalks in LA, dump furniture and just like stacked on top, which was it was essentially a pre-made sculpture. It was great. It was it was it was really like a profound moment. I was like, oh my god, I was so excited when I saw these sofas. And so for about six months I started taking pictures of this all this dump furniture on the side of the road. And the paintings really did, they were they really the figures that came from these drawings of the furniture were very restricted in, in these bound, the boundaries of the furniture, they became very square and they became 
they had no heads, a lot of them, and the furniture really pushed out to the edge of the painting. I really felt like there was this, this boundary, the ceiling that the paintings were trying to push out of, and, and there was like a claustrophobia, that like they were boxed in, um, which is it's just really interesting when referencing being a woman and how you feel as a woman, like physically, literally being stuck in the house and being able to, unable to get out, but also being having this invisible sort of repression around you. So there's a couple of paintings in this exhibition, Love and Support, which is in the back room here, and another one downstairs under you. That you you do see the figures quite literally pushing out mm. under the canvas or up from the canvas. With it. Yeah, the hands are the hands are pushing out, which was a certain unconscious thing to do. But I, I like the that a lot of them was about being a woman and, and holding up the family. Like without even the uh, it crumbles, and I, and I like the way they were holding that. There's also a lot of uh, the the figures are holding a, a stick or a baguette, which is my reference to male. That's about the only reference. I <laughs> and uh, this painting here, couple. This was one of the first paintings of the series. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's still got it. It's very like connected to its furniture origins. And just by adding the hands and the feet is kind of what gives it a figurative aspect. But beyond that, it's yeah. I was just experimenting with it actually, and I really like the ambiguous ambiguousness of it. It's still a favorite piece of mine because it's just like so tentative. And um, whereas going on further, I automatically create the figure. The figure comes really simply and easily. But with this, it was. It was looking like an experiment. The figure wasn't there. It was just kind of pushing its way out. And then, and, and then to our, our left is, is actually one of the last pieces of the series mm -hmm. as well. So it's been quite interesting to see the sort of progression within the work. That you find these very sort of sinuous lines um, and this sort of um, overwhelming embrace as well between the figures. Yeah, it's, it's kind of, I don't know how to say it, but it's, it, it's a sort of a gesture that I keep using over and over again, these arms embracing. Can you stay loud, please? We're struggling. Okay. Um, so this painting here, I don't know if you saw it, but it, it, it there's a gesture in it. Like the, the figures in it, it's a very, it's a, it's a, I, I've used it over and over again, and it's the larger figure hanging over the front figure, embracing it. To me, it was embracing, but I, I've discussed this painting with many people, and they feel like the big figure is a repressive figure. It's like repressing it and holding it back, which, yeah, I think there's also that aspect too. Uh, for me, a lot of these are about relationships and, and what you sacrifice when you're in a relationship for what you gain. Like You gain love and support, but you sacrifice your freedom. Uh, and, and you also you kind of morph into one another. So I feel that you know, although that wasn't the intention, it's an interesting observation. At times, some of the paintings seem quite cathartic. How much, how important do you think in painting is um, cathartic in your practice? Um, really important. Yeah, it's um, it's very therapeutic. I've been through, had a pretty turbulent year, and I do feel like it's been one way to help me get through it and deal with it. It's also a bit like journaling. It's like writing. It's, the paintings are very autobiographical, so I feel like if you know me and what has been going on, you can kind of track the process, and with previous collections as well. <coughs> I think it's kind of obvious what's you know subconsciously going on. Bianca, you're known to um, to have done a number of exhibitions on, on women artists and sort of looking at women artists um, of the past, or sort of readdressing their gender and in the art world. Do you think this is a sort of a, a theme, right? Uh, the compounding being readdressing women artists in particular, or, or autobiography? I mean, certainly, I think. You know, I think for yeah, I think I mean I think for most women, the artists you know already being in a, in a on the back foot in terms of being in the art world, being an artist, being perceived outside of the domestic setting is what often fuels some of their interests and what their concerns are. I mean, art, the creation of art should be in some way a reflection of a condition or a state of mind which you know, in some ways either encapsulates the, the, the zeitgeist of the time or is so forward thinking as to contradict or um, contradict or to comment on what's on what's happening. Um, I mean I think when in regards to 
women artists in particular, there's sort of the body is something that is very, you know, reoccurring. That's not to say that there aren't, of course, abstract women artists, um, but more that we have often seen that in you know the, the sort of examination of the body, whether that's through the idea of the gaze, which is a you know a long-term art historical reference, you know everything from you know the Venus de Rubino to, to Olympia by Manet. You know it's about looking at how women are perceived through the male gaze, and then the other is the domestic setting, which we, which you know Tani talked about a lot. And I think you know there's a lot of women artists that in the last let's say. 30, 40 years are being re-examined for their critical study of what is taking place in the changes that are shifting in society. Um, you know, artists like Valley Export, for example, from Vienna, she went around the streets um, with a, a box over her open breasts with a curtain, and she invited people to stick their hand in, and it was called Tap and Touch. And that was, you know, an incredibly groundbreaking piece of art because it was suggesting to people, let me look you in the eyes while you stick your hand into my, on, on my breast, you know? I'm going to confront you with something that's been perceived as sacred or, you know, sexual, and I'm going to take ownership of it. Um, another really interesting artist is Helen Chadwick, for example, who's, you know, a British artist who did this incredible series of work that we exhibited as to called Wreaths to Pleasure. And it was a series of photographs where she used domestic household cleaning liquids and flowers, things that are historically associated with women, and created these incredible mandala abstract forms. You know, so it's something that was again perceived to be almost like a universal image, but made with materials that were uniquely tailored to the woman's experience. Um, you know, so I think certainly, you know, there is an importance to saying that, you know, I'm a woman artist, this is the things that concern me, but I also think that a, a good artist isn't, you know, can make work that appeals and that relates to all of our experiences. I think uh, the way that you look at the body within your work, um, it's very, very interesting, going back to the gaze, what you talked about, Bianca, is that the portrayal of the body within your work and your figure is very different to how I, I believe it's a male artist not sexualized in the same way. You're still talking about sex and intimacy and relationships, but in a very different way from a woman's perspective. Um, Kiki, what's your perspective? Yeah, I think that that's very interesting, the, the way um, you approach the human body. And I think this, return, uh, this um, reverse game, like women looking at themselves, it's something that uh, is, is currently being explored by many young female painters, yeah. especially, you know, which is something that we were discussing earlier. And then, uh, and obviously there's a complexity of different issues, you know, because being a woman is not just being a mother, and it's not just being, you know, it's not just one thing. So you have artists like a uh, young Argentinian artist whose uh, work is currently showing at, at the group show at Hayward Gallery called Admin Oliti. And so her take is, is more like, I mean, like she is gen she's more like um, gender fluid right now. You know, like she, and her paintings kind of document this process of thinking about uh, searching for an agenderless figure, you know? And then you I think definitely comes across in the old, right? Because, yeah. You know, I would say most of the figures in your paintings are genderless, or they appear genderless. Yeah. Yeah, no, that was the intention. Uh, it's quite hard when it's when doing the figure, it's, what I want to do is bring it back and make it ambiguous, even less figurative. Not so much genderless, but also ambiguous. Figurative. And I think there's this kind of like, which I can relate somehow to the Tassilo paintings again. It's almost this ancestral figure, you know, yeah. like, totally. uh, it's not so much like a woman or a man, or, but figures that are a bit more symbolic, mm -hmm. more ancestral. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, completely. Um, which is why I really have to stop myself when, I'm, when it comes to the hands to not try and make them look too much like hands. Like to remove the fingers. Uh, it's very hard when you make when you when you put your when you have a figure not to follow through and, and try and make it look like a figure in an anatomically correct way. And I think the paintings for me that have been more successful are the ones where I've been, been able to do this. And the ones that have been less successful for me uh, are the ones where I have worked too hard at trying to make it look like a 
a figure that's in, in uh, proportion and the hands look right, that it's very hard, I feel like we're conditioned to try and make a figure look like a figure. It really, it doesn't matter. And there's the use of colour, which is very strong throughout your entire practice, but I, I found within, within this particular series, um, you have these very strong tones of yellows and greens. Um, there's often times a sort of symbolic value to the colours. Mm, yeah, I mean, I was trying, I did work with pink for a long time, which I thought had a really, for me at the time, it was a very visceral, tangible, fleshy colour, which was really important to me at the time, that it was representative of the body. And then now, I, I, apart from this one, I'm trying to move, I was trying to move away from the gender-specific colours and from colours that were uh, human, uh, like body-specific. So there was yellows and oranges and greens. Um, for a long time, I did yellow and green in the paintings a lot, and I really enjoyed that. Also, yellow has this weird uh, sort of symbolic value to me. And when I was, I had three sisters, and when we were growing up, we were all um, assigned a colour when we were born, and then everything was given to us was in that colour, and our rooms were done up in that colour, and I was yellow. My entire room was yellow, the walls, the curtains, the bed linen, I was dressed in yellow. It was just always the yellow baby. <laughs> so now, like, yellow is my colour. I love yellow. So, like, yeah, the yellow has some value to me. I mean, I think in our historical terms, it has a lot of resonance as well. When you think of Gauguin, or you think of the experience of color, you know, it's like, you know, of course, it's, it's about perception, and, and the way that you experience color is deeply personal, it's how you associate it with certain things, and it's also, um, you know, it's infinite in some way, because you're, you know, you're, you're, you're not necessarily, you know, uh, but there, there's contrast and, and there are um, colors that look better together, for example, or that, that give you pleasure when you look at them, or colors that, you know, they, they, they say can cause insanity, or, you know, there's this certain connotation with color, too, and, and being rooted in reality. So choosing to paint something that's not a natural color is also in some way making a statement about perception and, you know, how you want people to experience your paintings. Yeah. I mean, that I did have, there was a, you know, working with yellow and also recently working with black and working with pink, it's, it's not race neutral. And although that wasn't my intention, it's difficult when making paintings not to think about how they're going to be perceived. And, and the, because a lot of my figures, some of them are being repressed and submissive and some of them are powerful. It's like, if I make the repressed figure in black, what will people think of that? And it's, for me, it's, it, color is really important and it's more about how the colors work together and, and the choice of color, actually it's not black, it's dark green, but it's, it's, I thought about that towards the end, about how they would be perceived, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't an intention. But I think everyone has their own perception of colors as well and what they, you know, what they need to be. There's a number of motifs that also recur throughout your paintings. Mm -hmm. um, you'll see in this exhibition, um, often the stick that you touched on, upon before, and the, and the cactus. Mm -hmm. um, are you able to speak a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean the stick and the cactus are my phallic symbols. They're just, they are, because um, a lot of the paintings, to me, felt to do with female power. Even though the figures are genderless, for me it was it's a personal thing about female power, female independence. I like the, the aspect of the tribe, there's like the strength in numbers, and I just I thought it was just kind of funny that there were no men in the paintings, and I kind of wanted to kind of nod to them just to let them know that I was still thinking about them. And I, the, the stick, which was actually a baguette initially, but it kind of morphed into a stick in some of the paintings, did come naturally from the arm of an armchair. But uh, I started using it a lot, and I really, I just thought it was kind of funny. And I, it's kind of, it's not in every painting, but I kind of liked it as a signature. And another feature of the exhibition is the inclusion of a soft sculpture of yours, which has almost kind of come full circle from looking at the sort of found objects and establishes, and then creating these kind of sculptural pieces um, from the paintings to. Um, I think there's some close associations when we look at Terry Lucas and Louise Bourgeois. Can you think of Dorothea Tanning as well, which recently showed us a bit more 
I mean, I very well obviously didn't need the political art in Sarah Lucas, but I only um, heard about Dorothy Tenney quite recently. But the idea really uh, of the soft sculptures was I was making a figure from these found items of furniture, and I had this idea to then make uh, the figure back into furniture. So when I made the soft sculptures, I was to fold them into something similar to like an armchair or a sofa that, you know, essentially could be sat on if it was made, because I've made much bigger ones, life-size ones. Uh, and then I was going to paint from them again, photograph and paint them, although that didn't really, it didn't really work. But I liked, actually, I liked the sculptures in their own right. And I like the, they're all hand sewing, and I, and I like the, sort of, the traditional craft of sewing. Because while I was, dark, like, sewing holes in my kids' jeans up, I was also sewing these sculptures, and it just felt very, it, it just, I don't know, it felt, Strongly linked, you know, to being a woman in traditional, you know, crafts of women. And, and there is a sort of strong link, as you said, between um, the making of things and, and sort of the craftsmanship of sewing and traditional women's practice, even within the canon of art history. Um, do you agree? Yeah, and I think there's an interesting uh, relationship with uh, the recent kind of. Um, recognition of textile art or ceramic art in the past, I don't know, like five years? Yeah. Um, yeah. Not, not much more than that. Yeah. Um, so these kinds of pra practices that were kind of historically historically relegated to a kind of craft, yeah, yeah. To, yeah to the category of craft, are currently being uh, more and more evaluated. And if we think, if we ask ourselves why were they relegated to the category of uh, craft, perhaps it's because uh, people relate this practice to, to female work, no? Uh, yeah. Although not all ceramists or, or textile artists are women, no? Yeah. Um, yeah. No, we have, for example, we have a group show on Desk 2 at the moment, which includes a lot of women and who work in fiber art. And, you know, that's not to say that it was always perceived that way as part of craft. In 1969, MoMA did an exhibition called Wall Hangings, which focused solely on the pioneers of fiber and fabric art. And you know, artists like Jagoda Buick, Francoise Grossman, who are included in our show, they were experimenting with, you know, grappling things with like you know ide ideas of identity and how you know functional objects that are made. Are, are kind of perceived within the greater history of that culture. Olga de Amaral is another great example, mm -hmm. Colombian artist who is getting a lot of recognition at the moment, but particularly because you know she's 87, she's had a very long career active since the 50s, but because she she's woven together in her work everything from pre-Columbian kind of um, ancestral uh, you know ideas of identity with current day uh, experimentation and weaving and the, you know the, almost the advanced of, of these kinds of materials and methods, which can be more closely tied to notions of function mm -hmm. than necessarily. And also, like the Annie yeah. Albers yeah. exhibition. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Annie yeah. Albers yeah. yeah. You saw African textiles, yeah. um, Colombian Mexican textiles. You know, there was this whole uh, attempt to position Annie Albers' work in the history of, of, of weaving and, 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 and uh, textile working. Mm -hmm. And so they do on A2, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. Yeah. And, um, and you, you deal a lot with uh, the exhibitions with artists from South America. And so an interesting, uh, interesting thing about that region is that for a long time, uh, women artists were, were celebrated in a different way than, than here. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, Brazil, I think, is a very specific case in the context not only of uh, Latin America, but also if you compare to, to what happened uh, with modernism in the US and Europe. Because uh, the early modernism in Brazil, the, the kind of interwar modernism uh, in the 20s, uh, was very much a, a literary movement. So there are a few artists, and the, the, the two main names uh, of early Brazilian modernism were women, one of them, Tarsila do Amaral, the one I mentioned uh, before, and Anita Malfatti. And then uh, in the 50s, uh, this whole generation that uh, absorbed these uh, abstract geometric trends, there were many uh, female and male artists, of course, 
But the ones that uh, uh, got uh, international recognition, and this is a movement that starts perhaps in the late 80s and 90s, like some of the main names of uh, what, we, what we call the neo-concrete movement in Brazil, it's a movement of, of the 60s, are female, like people like Lydia Clark, uh, Lydia Papi, uh, Mira Schendel, all these women uh, are today represented by the, you know, like the most blue chip galleries, uh, international blue chip galleries. Uh. So it is quite a, a, a case in point, Brazil, I think. And even if you take, like, for for, for instance, contemporary auctions, uh, the contemporary names uh, they are like kind of like amongst the top uh, prices. Uh, people like Adriana Varejão, Beatriz Milas, they're also, also like female artists that continue to, to kind of... Yeah, it's true, it's very unique in that sense. Yeah. 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 And I think the representation of women is very important within, as a subject within your painting, Tani, but also um, taking a step back and looking at the, uh, the representation of women artists in the art world. Um, there, it has been a big discussion, particularly in the last couple of years, I believe, um, but we do look at sort of the museums and the underrepresentation of women artists in museums and also at auctions. And I think it's very relevant to now that the culture we live in now, it is readdressed and we do look at that in balance. I mean, I can, I know that uh, when I look at the auctions, about 14% of, of work sold at auction is by women artists. When you look at the very top percent, it's probably about one, if, if 0.5. Um, even within the museum collections within the UK, it's under 30% of the collections are by women artists, and even at a Tate Modernist, it's below that. So, I mean, it's pretty bad. I think um, the collections in Scotland are also pretty bad. Um, Bianca, are you able to? I mean, I, so I can't, I, I can't speak directly to the auctions, even though I work for some because I don't really work on the, on the auction side, but I, what I can kind of contribute in this sense is I think it's not necessarily a discussion of why these things don't show up at the market and, and why they don't achieve the high prices or historically haven't. I think it's more about understanding the context from which they were created in and why, for some reason, these artists have, women artists have been, for one reason or another, overlooked or marginalized or remained on the periphery. <laughs> And I think a lot of these factors are really related to, you know, things like economic factors, like why would, would a woman become an artist when she has to, you know, historically stay at home and take care of kids and, you know, things like that. And, and also because there's a certain uh, feeling of intimidation as well. You know, a lot of the artists that we've, that we've worked with in our states, at least in the past, have have often been, you know, perceived in relation to male counterparts. So, like for example, Kim Lim, who's an incredible Singaporean-born Chinese-British artist, she is most like most, you know, well known until recently as the wife of William Turnbull, an incredibly famous artist in his own right, who had a major Tate retrospective in the 70s. And though she, I would argue she is as good an artist, if not better. You know, there was always this kind of difficult relationship of, you know, he was the artist in the family, and she had to stay at home, take care of the kids, but still, you know, be able to work in a, in, a, in her domestic setting. And she did. She had no studio assistance. She had an incredible output of work. And but the last time her pieces were seen in London beyond our exhibitions was in 1999 at her posthumous, you know, Camden retrospective. So I think. You know, I think it's the, the, the market and the auctions are the delayed reaction of what is happening in our history. It's, it's what comes at the end, whereas the factors and the development of an artist's career is what really sets the tone for, you know, 30, 40, 50, 100 years down the line. It's also how we write our history, and that's being changed massively. You know, we are accepting that there are many new narratives. You know, there's not just you know, the white male narrative, and that's the truth. And, and that is happening and filtering in all aspects of culture, not just art. So why, you know, wouldn't it happen now? Why wouldn't artists, women artists, who are just as good as their male counterparts, be recognized on the marketplace? Can I ask a question? Yeah. Do, you, do you feel that that's different here than to, say, the America, to LA, to New York, or the States? Um, to either of you I'm speaking or? I mean, the, the environment in which I situate myself in LA is, is a very emerging market and, and it's all about uh, network and community and it's very balanced. I mean, the shows, 
going on, there are sort of grassroots shows, artist-run spaces, and there is a great representation of both. For women. As For women, women that's and wonderful. men and people of color. And, and mm -hmm. I mean, the white male is suffering in LA. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have yeah, a few everywhere. friends of those, and they're like, oh yeah, no, I'm a white man. Mm -hmm. No one's interested in me. I think it's more about the acceptance of new narratives, you know, and it's like you have this period where you need to also um, kind of, I don't want to say, but grapple with it, you know, and, 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 and as a result there is a focus on women artists, on women of artists of color, you know, but that doesn't, it's, in a way, it's, I would also argue that, I don't know if you want to talk about this later, but it's a bit of a caveat, too, because it makes it, it perceives things as othering, you know, when actually we should, they should just be perceived as equal. Yeah. But in the history, when you've seen, um, say, retrospectives or exhibitions in museum, to me, I mean, this is my opinion and my perspective, that the America has been much more open to um, women artists than here. I mean, that's arguable. I mean, you could say that all the women AVEX artists weren't recognized until recently. Um, you know, there's this kind of, I think it's, it also goes to show you that there are many views and art worlds out there. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it also depends, you know, America is a big country. Every, I would say even every, every country has its own sort of trajectory in terms of recognition when it comes to things like that. And I think really comes down to museum directors, curators, people who push that program. Mm -hmm. But it also comes down to precedence. Yeah. I mean, I'm, cute, I'm very interested in it. Tony talked about going to America, and you talked about various <clears throat> sort of personal issues you had around being a woman. Um, and I was going to ask a question about, uh, and by the way, congratulations on the show, which is, <laughs> I, I, I confess I'm a local, I walk my dog past your paintings every day. And, you know, what's wonderful about them is on the one hand they're incredibly declaratory because the gestures are big and grand, but then there's this wonderful sort of intimate things going on inside all the paintings which are wonderful intimate narratives which are very beautiful and engaging. But what I was going to actually ask you apart from why does a woman who is in your position go and be in a country where the president makes a, you know, is deliberately sort of, you know, in the position he is in relation to women, etc. But then I thought of a much more difficult question to ask you <laughs> because you talked about um, so the success of your paintings, which is a very honest thing for an artist to raise in a public gathering in a way. So my question is, um, which of your paintings here do you think is the most successful and why? And which of your paintings here is the least successful and why? <laughs> well, it's personal, isn't it? Often the paintings I like the least are the ones that everyone else likes the most. Um, I'm not going to say which one I like the least because someone might have purchased it. <laughs> I like that very much. Um, I, I like them for different reasons. I mean, this one is, re I really feel it's very strong. It was the first one I made, and I think that uh, it's like anything when you enter into something unknown, you can't really get it wrong because you don't have the experience. And so I went into it with no expectations and, and no idea of what I was making, and it came out of that, whereas I think it, the further you go on with like a with a collection of paintings, it's very difficult to break out of a formula that you find your way into, and you lose some of that spontaneous and sort of luck or mystery. Um, and I think, you know, you can see when you get further down to the last painting, there's a, little, a lot of work has gone into it, a lot of like reworking layers and redrawing, and it's, it's I've got to a point where I know what works and what I want to do, and I'm torn between creating something that works or something new. I've got more characters in it, I've got more, I, I mean, this one is just fresh to me because it's it's new, it's like the birth of this collection. Thank you. Pass the question. I have it, I see a question in the back, yes. Yeah. Some of the young figures seem to be placed in very uncomfortable poses. <laughs> Does that represent your own experience or do you see discomfort being a universal thing experience? I mean, and that pressure is not pressure on the show, by the way. I think a lot of the uncomfort is, is an unconscious decision. I mean, the paintings, a lot of them literally come from furniture. So this one, you can really see the chair that it came, it came from. But I suppose 
I made a choice as to whether to. It, it does feel quite um, stiff. Tense. Tense. And, like and, her feet. Her feet. That's uncomfortable. When she's like. Yeah, it's, it's not like comfy. That. I mean, I, I think at the time I was literally grappling with some with some personal stuff, and you can really see that there's like a there's a struggle going on. Um, so I think a lot of it is related to like personal issues and what's going on at the time. Um, but also, I, like, I made a decision sometimes whether I really wanted to follow the lines of the furniture and stick within the realms of that, and others, as the collection goes on, I stopped using the furniture as references less and less and less. And so when I start moving away from the furniture as the composition, then the figure naturally softens and becomes more figurative and less stiff and awkward. Thank you. It has a very strong reference, um, I think, to the sort of the dancers as well, mm -hmm. Matt and Tease, which I think yes. is lovely. And I, I think um, yeah, there's many layers to your painting. Your yeah, I've used, I've, I've used that piece before in a painting in a, in a work I think previously, so I have referenced as work. Well. And going back a little bit to, to um, the sort of the gender narratives within your work, you're, the gender narrative as a theme within your work is very reflective of the wider culture that we're all living in now, which I think is so so relevant and so timely. Um, do you have to say? Yeah, I, I don't know if you if you wanna um, get into this right now, but uh, we have been talking a lot about this. Um, uh, about this uh, kind of new generation of female painters, and but also about like uh, the question of women representation in the arts and how this seems to be changing quite uh, dramatically, I think. Uh, and I think what, one um, one of the examples of that there's a foundation in London called the Freelance Foundation. And they conduct uh, surveys about uh, representation of women in Britain every year. They've been doing it for a few years. And then in 2018, they just released the, the 2018 uh, report. And uh, although there are still some like really, you know, like um, big gaps in terms of. Um, for instance, 66% of um, postgraduate students in the creative arts and design are women. But then when you take um, the top London commercial galleries, 68% of represented artists are men. And they ask this very interesting question, I think, which is, uh, so what happens between graduation and mid-career for women? And, and maybe maybe you could say a few words about your own trajectory and your peers' trajectory. Yeah, I mean for me it's it's very very obvious. I, I left art school and I immediately got engaged. A year later I got married. A year after that I got pregnant, and then the next year I had the baby, and then five years, uh, three years later I got pregnant again, and then I had another baby. So it was like this 15-year period of marriage and babies. I was still working. I worked from home, I got a studio, I put on my own shows, I, I found a gallery, but it was, it was you know, it was, my, my focus was, was spread out. And while my, my, my partner's star was rising, I was maintaining, but I wasn't able to sort of get to the place where, you know, I wasn't really able to put my full attention in. And I, whether, I don't know, whether, whether it's marriage and babies, I, that, that's my own personal experience of what, where the gap is. And only now am I starting to get to a point where I can really focus, like travel without kids, leave them behind with people. So that's my experience. Yeah. But I mean, I, do you, I mean, I guess it comes back to is the, is the personal political? Yeah, and that's always been the question is, you know, if that's your personal experience, but I think also if we were to take a sort of wide view, it seems to be. Uh, a commonality between many women artists. Um, and that's why there's this sort of um, thing happening in the art world now being a bit of, of just sort of, um, readdressing um, women that have been practicing art for many years. I mean, I think it's also, you know, the idea of rediscovering or re examining is nothing new. But I think where 
because of the splintering, of, of the ironic splintering of the world, despite being more globalized and connected, means that we value new narratives and we value things that allow us to connect with stories that that actually speak to a wide range of us, even though they might seem niche or unique. And I think that is what really, you know, is what makes this whole kind of a momentum around, you know, rediscovering artists or re-examining, recontextualizing um, artists that have been right on the periphery so important. Um, you know, I, I, I think that to use like an example in literature, for example, is Ursula Le Guin, who's an incredible female sci-fi writer, and she she talks a lot about the hero narrative and how from the beginning of time, you know, this idea of the you know the sword or the tool as what driven as what is what driven has driven civilization and society. But actually, if you really think logically about it, the thing that existed before the tool and the spear and the sword was the carrier bag. You know, the thing that held everything together after you were hunter, hunting and gathering, you know? Or before you were hunting, sorry, when you were gathering. And so it's this kind of flip of what is understood as the most fundamental or primal example of a tool that exists for, you know, a matriarchal society before a patriarchal society. And I think that is that is something that is being resurfaced and re-examined in all walks of culture and particularly in, in do you find, Tani, in your work, or at, um, in the position that you are yet, that you have to be sort of twice as bold and twice as courageous in, in, your, in the creation of your work? I mean, I don't know, because I only have my perspective to go on. I feel like I have pushed this, I've pushed pretty hard. Um, but I do feel like my contemporary, male contemporaries, also push pretty hard. I think at my stage in my career, it feels pretty equal, especially where I'm situated at the moment. I don't know. I think when you get to it, when you get to the next stage, is potentially where you reach problems. I mean, I personally have there's a struggle in making the work, getting myself out there, but that was in a, in a that was in my own personal environment, of struggling with marriage and kids and trying to make. But from my experience now where I'm in LA, it feels like everyone is working really hard putting their work out there and don't feel they're at necessarily at a disadvantage or anything. Cool. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, we'll take it over to the floor now and um, we'd love to have some thoughts or observations or questions. Um, I was really interested in your, um, how you talked about collections, this is my first painting, this is my last painting, and I was wondering, um, a couple of things came to mind, oh, sort of, how long is this lay period between collections, or how do you approach collections, do you think, or oh, if you have an exhibition coming up, actually form a collection, or is it more of an organic idea of constructing a collection that, that is then presented to the gallery, I was just quite interested in that idea of this, not, not a continual creative process in terms of painting on the canvases. It is a continual painting process, but things happen along the way which inform something. So I, the, this, the discovery of the furniture on the side of the road was kind of a starting point. It marked a point where I was like, okay, this is, this is what I've been looking for, because what happens generally is, and I feel it happening now with this, is you, you get to a point where you kind of wrung out everything you can from this particular thing and the paintings that originated from that kind of trail off and I'm kind of experiencing that now whereby I've made a lot of work and I've been using this thing and, I, and I'm feeling like now I'm actually taking a break from working from making so I'm giving myself a month month and a half where I'm, I'm not actually making anything I'm just I'm just thinking I'm coming up with ideas I'm thinking like where is this where is this going I'm looking for like influences and seeing shows and um, walking a lot and, and thinking. So it's not always the same, but it is a continual process and it's not a, oh, I'm, I'm gonna start now and this is gonna be a collection. But it's often like it's cyclical, you know? Like at, you start the all of energy at the beginning and all these ideas and then it sort of peters out. But I mean, I think that when artists, when you, when you have a lot of shows booked in, 
you do have to think more about like what you're going to make because you want there to be um, some cohesiveness to the paintings. And often when you keep making, there's a very big disparity between the painting at the beginning and the painting at the end. So it is important to think in terms of collections, but I also think there's a natural cycle. Thank you. Can I follow up with a really quick second question? I'm going to leave it. Um, it, was interesting. it was very simplistic about the colour, because it, you went pretty, all you went pretty deep, but I just wondered, with the move to LA, was your colour palette just affected by the colour around you in LA, because it's so different from the colours that you might see in the UK? I mean, my paintings have always been really bright, but I did do a show about six months after, no, about six months after I moved to LA. I did a show in New York, and they, half the paintings they used were London paintings they made before, and the other half the paintings they made in LA. And there was a big difference, actually. And, and there was almost a difference in style as well. Like, the London paintings were much more geometric and angular, more right angles, and the paintings in LA softened a lot. I think that was actually less about LA and more about the personal experience of moving. Um, the, the, yeah, the colours have changed, but I also feel that it maybe is not to do with LA. Thank you. And that goes back to the sort of momentum around your work at the moment. You talked about different collections. This year has been incredibly busy for you. Um, you've had five, four exhibitions. You've just recently shown at the Torrance Art Museum as well, and, and you did a group show in Italy, um, a solo show in LA. It's been, it's been busy. <laughs> it happens, I guess, like that. There's momentum. Um, and so this is this is my last show uh, for the next few months. So I'm gonna, I've taken a few months, a couple of months off making work, and then when I go back to LA in August, I have a new studio, I move downtown, and I've got lots of ideas now. So I, I'm, I'm possibly having a solo in LA at the end of the year or early next year. So that will be what I'm studying for the course.